Okay, today's lecture is on ultrasound of the breast. Now, you're probably wondering, why would you scan a person's breast? Well, here are the various reasons one would do that. Um, these are the indications, if you will. First of all, uh, anytime somebody has a mass that was found either through palpating uh, their own breast or a physician palpates their breast, or um, it was found on a screening mammography, this is another way to evaluate uh, that mass, as you will see. And one of the advantages of ultrasound allows us to basically scan in any uh, orientation we want and to get a really good three-dimensional uh, image in our mind, we may need to move that probe in many different planes in order to do that. And ultrasound is really useful in patients with um, really dense breasts, which is more common in, in women who are younger, and also um, in those dense breasts, masses are more difficult to detect. And uh, another reason to use ultrasound is to guide um, either drainage procedures, like for an abscess, or uh, a cyst, or to, uh, to guide a, uh, an aspiration, like a biopsy. And then uh, finally, um, you wouldn't really use it for a screening tool, except for women who are under 30, who are at risk for developing breast cancer. Um, uh, or uh, patients with a palpable breast lump, again, dense breasts, patients who are pregnant or lactating. Um, when you're pregnant, you have sort of a relative uh, contraindication for radiation. And then uh, also in patients with breast augmentation, as you'll see, um, ultrasound can be quite helpful. Now, the normal breast anatomy is uh, it's very, very simple. And uh, like most, most glandular tissue, it has this uh, very typical layer. So we can see really three main uh, layers here. This is the layer number one here is the subcutaneous layer. This is just sort of subcutaneous fat here. And then, um, like all glandular tissue that we've seen on ultrasound so far, the thyroid, the testicles, things like that, it has this sort of uh, appearance, uh, relatively, um, I would say, isoechoic here with the different uh, lobules of breast tissue here. So that's called the glandular layer. And then behind that is what we call the retromammary retro uh, layer. And uh, this is basically skeletal muscle, pectoralis muscle we can see here. This is a rib uh, right here with the shadow coming down which I know you're all used to from looking at all that lung ultrasound. And so therefore, if this is the rib, what do you suppose this white line over here is, and then uh, this white line over here is? That's right, this is the, uh, the pleural line. Exactly, so that's what you'd see if the patient's breathing in and out, you would see this pleural line sliding back and forth. So we, and on this image over here, we can see the same thing. We can see sort of a uh, skin over here, and then this um, subcutaneous uh, fat right here. Then we can see the, the actual glandular tissue, uh, what's known as the mammary layer, and then finally the retro mammary, retro mammary layer, which is really the, the pectoralis muscle, rib, and then the pleural line, kind of all together as one layer. Now, in the normal uh, lactating breast, uh, what happens is um, you get uh, these ducts, these fluid-filled ducts uh, start to really become a lot more prominent because uh, it's all filled with milk. And um, the actual, in some of these, you can see that epithelial layer be very, very prominent there within the actual uh, ducts. And we can see those uh, quite prominently throughout this um, lactating breast. And um, one of the other things you can see qu quite easily are the, uh, the suspensory ligaments known as Cooper's ligaments. And we can see these, they look like uh, hyperechoic lines. When you get them on the right angle here, you can see um, that very obvious looking uh, hyperechoic line, which is Cooper's ligament. We see those throughout the breast tissue quite commonly. And then there's this other um, concept called frematis. Frematis is where the patient hums while you do um, power flow Doppler. And what you see is that when the patient's humming, there's these vibrations that occur. And um, you can, you can uh, feel them through the wall during palpation, the, the vibrations as you hum. And then um, also when you use the power Doppler, um, everything lights up on power Doppler with frematis or humming, except for where the mass is. And so this is a way to localize a mass using power Doppler, the technique of uh, frematis, having the patient hum. Now, the various um, characteristics that help us differentiate um, something benign from something malignant, we're going to go through 
um, many of these uh, just briefly here. And um, if you look at the, the, the margins of, of, the, of the mass, a benign lesion has a nice, smooth, rounded margin, whereas malignancies uh, tend to grow through tissue layers through something called spiculation. Um, spiculation are finger-like extensions of the malignant tumor. Um, it looks like a little kind of small line that's going outward uh, from the mass. These are spicules here, spiculation we can see. Uh, sometimes on ultrasound. And um, this actually, when you see these speculations like this, um, these speculated margins, that's actually got the highest predictive value that this is actually a malignant uh, tumor. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll see these alternating layers of hyperechoic material with these hypoechoic speculating uh, lines. The other thing about the, um, ab about the mass is its shape. Now, a benign mass is very round or sometimes oval. Um, and maybe you'll see some sort of mild undulations in the contour of the mass. Um, and uh, the, the, the lobulations um, sometimes can be large uh, lobulations, but usually you don't have more than three big lobulations. Uh, however, with malignant masses, though, you get these very sharp angulations um, and um, a lot of microlobulations, small, uh, less than, you know, two millimeters, you get these sharp, and there's a whole bunch of them, these microlobulations. So if you see that, that's more consistent with, um, with something malignant. Now, another thing you want to look at is the, uh, the echogenic pattern of these, of these masses. And a benign lesion usually have, they usually have isochoic um, echo patterns to them, like this one here. Um, or sometimes it's uh, brighter than the fat. So this is like the fat layer up here. This is that mammary layer here. And we can see these, these echoes here. It's very subtle, but it's slightly more echogenic, I would say, than the subcutaneous fat is. Certainly uh, at least equivalent to. Whereas with the malignant lesion down here, they're usually hypoechoic. OK, so that's one major obvious way to determine the, the difference between these masses. It's hypoechoic um, with very weak uh, internal echoes. And then there's often shadowing posteriorly. And um, this uh, makes the lesion harder to penetrate because of the, um, the material that these masses, that these malignancies are made up of, uh, and sometimes, which causes more shadowing. And sometimes there's even microcalcifications within these masses that obviously also is going to cause more shadowing. So uh, benign, more isochoic, malignant, uh, hypoechoic. And then another thing are the attenuation effects. With the benign mass, um, because they're not as dense, the sound can penetrate through them, and actually you get uh, posterior acoustic enhancement. Think about the bladder or the gallbladder. Whenever you see those organs, behind those two organs, it looks more hyperechoic, more echo bright. Um, whereas, um, uh, and that's kind of similar as to what's going on here with the benign mass. We see um, it's more hyperechoic behind the mass. Look at that compared to the malignant mass. It's all like shadowing back here. And so that's another major difference are the attenuation effects much higher. The sound is attenuated much more in a malignancy, mostly because of its density. There's other issues too, like mobility, compressibility, and uh, vascularity. And so um, benign lesions um, have a um, limited degree of mobility, um, but they can actually roll uh, when you palpate them. And, uh, and, they're, and they're somewhat compressible, whereas uh, malignant lesions, they're fixed, they're rigid, they don't move at all. They're non-compressible, they're hard, okay? So that's, that's another way to distinguish these on ultrasound. And then um, another thing is with vascularity. So if you put some color flow Doppler, which is what they've done here, you can see that with malignant masses, you get um, increased vascularity um, within the lesion and sometimes you can even make out, you know, a feeder vessel that's going going through this uh, structure here, and so and it's penetrating deep into the structure. We can see that there, and so a, a malignant mass will have this type of will demonstrate this type of vascularity using color flow Doppler. And cysts are very common, um, usually in women 35 to 40 years of age, and the cyst usually changes with the uh, the menstrual cycle. And um, 
Sometimes it can be painful when, if it grows uh, rapidly in size. There's two types of cysts, um, sebaceous cysts and galactoseals. Uh, galactoseals occurs um, when there's milk in the breast, but uh, sebaceous cysts are uh, the ones that, um, uh, you know, that occur without being um, pregnant when you're not lactating. And so we can see here, this is this, that um, subcutaneous uh, fat layer right here, and this is that the mammary layer, and here's this cystic structure here. This is another large cystic structure seen down here on ultrasound. Uh, we were just fanning through this um, very large, just um, simple cyst. And whereas a galactoseal, that's uh, also a cyst, but it's filled with, with milk. And it's usually right underneath the areola, and it occurs from an obstruction in one of the lactiferous ducts. And, um, you know, sometimes these can resolve spontaneously. Um, but um, occasionally you need to aspirate them um, to relieve the symptoms from this uh, obstructed uh, duct. Now, um, sonographically, these galactoseals um, can sometimes be seen as complicated cysts with um, some um, hypoechoic areas and some hyperechoic areas to them. Um, but depending on the age of, of its contents and the amount of fat and water within there, you'll see varying types of uh, morphologies here with these types of cysts. When galactoseals are new and composed mainly of milk without any separation, they appear more as solid masses um, with increased posterior acoustic enhancement. Um, as the galactoseals age, the fat water protein content separates and they become like more cystic in appearance. And typically with ultrasound, a fluid debris level can be seen. And as the patient moves around, this fluid debris level uh, can shift. Now, Fibroadenomas are the most common breast tumors. Uh, they usually occur in younger women, aged 20s and 30s. You get this smooth, um, firm, rubbery, hard lump with a, with a well-defined shape to it. It moves easily without any pain. Um, it ranges from one centimeter up to several centimeters. It does not change in size during the menstrual cycle as, a, as opposed to those other cysts. Um, they may get bigger, however, during pregnancy and with breastfeeding. But normally they grow you know, really slowly um, except um, when there's a hemorrhagic component, um, which the patient may note a sudden increase in the size of their, of their mass. Now, um, this is an example, several examples here of fibroadenoma. Um, it's a well-circumscribed ovoid uh, mass. Um, maybe just very subtle posterior acoustic enhancement over here, I kind of see it. Um, and, um, you know, to, to really differentiate these from something um, malignant, you really need to do a, um, a, a core biopsy of these, of these structures. And again, as I mentioned earlier, ultrasound can help guide the needle right um, to, the, to the main part of these masses to help um, have a, 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 um, a successful biopsy. Now, there's something called fibrocystic condition of the breast or, or lumpy breasts. It's where um, it involves the glandular uh, part of the breast tissue, and usually each month um, these, the glandular cells slough away each month. Um, however, um, if these cells uh, die or become apoptotic, um, then you get these scars in, in, in this region of the breast. And so this is what a fibrocystic breast looks like. You get the scarring um, with these, um, basically these large lumps seen here. and. Um, and on ultrasound, this is, this is what it looks like, just multiple, multiple cysts everywhere. And you can notice on the edges of these cysts, there's these shadows that come down. And there's another one here. Uh, and basically, that's um, something called refraction artifact. The sound is going through this uh, skin and then into this uh, glandular tissue here. And it reaches this cystic um, structure. And then the sound is redirected. And so this it goes through here, and then it gets redirected. And on the edges of that, uh, cystic structure, we get these, sh these shadows, lateral, sometimes we call it lateral cystic shadowing or um, refraction uh, artifact, the sound is being redirected. So that's, that's why we see these shadows here on the edges uh, of these cystic structures. Then there's lipomas, and um, this is, occurs uh, more often in menopausal or uh, middle-aged women, and you know, just sort of large, soft masses with irregular borders. Um, you can't seem to separate from the surrounding tissues. These are difficult to see on ultrasound. You have to kind of really strain your eyes and hallucinate a little bit. But they usually have smooth walls um, and 
the reason why they're so difficult to see is that they have the same um, echogenicity as as um, as fat. So we can see this lipoma here, and when you compress these, they're they're easily compressible. And then breast abscesses. These uh, this is something as an emergency physician I see quite often in the emergency department. Um, and it's usually during uh, breastfeeding uh, from uh, the cracked uh, nipples. We can also see this in uh, overweight women who smoke, who have large breasts. And uh, like every other abscess in the body, the borders are, are usually early on very initially poorly defined, but if, if it grows for a long time, it can start to become encapsulated as this abscess matures. And you can see these low-level echoes here, um, hypocote debris seen here on a still image. And down here, this video image shows um, basically these various uh, areas of hypocoat debris that when we compress it, the debris swirls around. I don't know if you can appreciate that, but that debris is sort of swirling around. That's what pus looks like on ultrasound. And again, you can use ultrasound to help um, guide the, the, the uh, drainage. Now moving on to malignancies um, uh, and other masses. This is a um, intraductal uh, papilloma. Um, these women um, come in with um, spontaneous nipple discharge. It comes from a single duct. Um, usually the discharge is copious, which is uh, usually preceded by the sensation of fullness or pain in the areola area. And then when that fluid comes out, uh, when it's expelled, there's um, usually a relief of the pain. And if you get a mammogram on these patients, it looks like there's a raspberry-like lesion on the, on the mammogram. And um, these these can often grow in size and become um, palpable. And it's actually um, a benign tumor um, within this uh, acini. And um, in women to age 35 to 55 years old, and uh, sometimes uh, they're small, but they can be multiple with uh, uh, multiple focal areas to them. It's basically just a proliferation of the duct epithelium that projects inwards into a dilated uh, lumen. We can see that again over here. Sonographically, they look like these little small, uh, multiple, multicentric uh, areas with um, simple, simple proliferations of the duct epithelium projecting outward into a dilated um, lumen, um, usually from uh, one or sometimes more than one focal point. And each one of these little papillomas, uh, introductal papillomas, is supported by a vascular stalk, if you were to put a color flow on there. and. Um, now, this is the most common type of breast cancer. It's called ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. And it starts in the milk ducts um, and, and usually stays there, but sometimes it can recur up to 30% up to of the time it can recur. Now, these red arrows here indicate the microcalcifications. Um, and note how um, readily these microcalcifications are seen here. And um, it's by far more common than the other type of uh, carcinoma called lobular carcinoma in situ. And more importantly, it should be distinguished um, as a clearly uh, malignant lesion, which, th which these are. And so uh, ductal epithelial cells basically undergo malignant transformation and proliferate intraluminally. Uh, eventually, the cells outstrip their blood supply and become necrotic centrally. This debris calcifies and is what is detected on both ultrasound and mammography. Um, now, these lesions uh, can also be uh, palpated uh, clinically, and they can be broken down into uh, five other subtypes, which I'm not going to really get into very much with ultrasound, but on this lecture anyways, but the five subtypes of DCIS, uh, which you probably already know, are, are comedo, papillary, micropapillary, solid, and cribiform. And um, most of these lesions actually are a combination of, of at least two of these uh, subtypes. Now, infiltrating uh, ductal carcinoma um, is, um, is when it spreads to the, it infiltrates and therefore spreads to the surrounding uh, breast tissues and can even spread uh, down into the lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. And it has these irregular uh, borders uh, like this. And this is sort of how it appears. Um, still, um, it's, it's, it's ductal. Now, when you move on to the lobular component of, of of these um, cancers, you get lobular carcinoma in, in situ, and there's usually um, no no symptoms, and it's uh, often missed on a screening mammogram because there's no calcium in these um, lesions, and uh, it's multifocal in more than half the cases, and um, 
you see these multiple lobules with these abnormal growth patterns to them. Sonographically, uh, you basically get this sort of ill-defined, um, hypochoic, um, usually, again, no calcifications. And these are the kind of lesions that come up on ultrasound that you see when you, when you look around for this kind of thing. And then there's infiltrating lobular carcinoma. And many of these patients uh, don't have any symptoms at all. Again, difficult to see on mammograms. The breast sort of becomes thickened or hardened um, rather than having a discrete lump. Um, but you can have um, breast fullness, swelling, change in the texture, and the nipple uh, can change as well, turn inward. And um, it's um, lower, infiltrating lobular carcinoma is a lower incidence and comprises less than 15% of breast cancers. It's um, a tendency to become really more multifocal. So you can see this in different, uh, different areas of um, focality and um, with the, really the same prognosis in, of that of a ductal carcinoma. And uh, this ultrasound image here shows, um, is, is of the left uh, axilla in a patient uh, basically who's got these it's hypochoic group of lymph nodes and the metastasis is seen here. So this is the, um, we can see this, this lymph node involvement along here. And so um, when you get um, metastases to the lymph nodes, you look up in the axilla, and this is the kind of thing that you can see, this very abnormally shaped um, lymph node with these lobules to it. It's very enlarged, I would just generally say, very enlarged lymph node. And uh, the same thing's going on over here. Here is the, um, the malignancy over here growing in the breast, and on the same view, if you stretch the probe out across and have uh, w one edge of the probe over in the axilla, you can see the enlarged lymph node on the same, um, in the same patient. So you see both the breast cancer and the lymph node if, you, if they're close enough together and you turn the probe that direction. Now, what about breast implants? This is something um, that we see that, that comes into the emergency department actually quite often. Um, and um, everything from acute post-surgical issues um, you know, regarding uh, wound healing and things like that to uh, trauma patients um, and possible um, implant ruptures. And so um, this is basically, the, this is all normal, what, what we're looking at here. And you can see there's a fold right here. When I first saw this on ultrasound, it uh, kind of threw me for a loop. I thought that there was a problem with the implant, but that's, that's just a normal fold. Um, and this is uh, sort of a normal amount of uh, free fluid seen within the capsule. See, there's these two layers. This is the capsular free fluid seen there. That's, that's normal to see that. And, um, and I like this mammogram here because it shows how you can get these folds in the implant. And so that, because I don't really do mammograms as an emergency physician, but I do a lot of breast ultrasounds, and, and especially with, with um, implant uh, problems. And now that I, I see this on the uh, mammogram, it makes me realize why I was seeing these, these folds here. And also, it looks like there's a discontinuity of this one here, but this is just a normal valve. This is, this is the implant valve here seen um, pretty easily, and you can see it actually on the mammogram as well. If you look closely, there's that implant valve there. And so it's, uh, you know, it's normal to see these things on, on, a, on a breast implant. Now, when you do have rupture, though, what happens is the silicon, if it's a silicon implant, um, the silicon extrudes, and uh, you can see it outside. Here's this fibrous capsule coming along here, and then we see it sort of outside. This is island of, and it's described here as poorly defined echogenic material distant to the implant with a dirty shadow or difficult to marcate shadow here. And, um, and this is a sign of um, silicon implant rupture. If it's a, if it's a saline implant rupture, um, it just looks like anechoic, you know, free fluid seen in, in different tissue layers. So um, not to burden you with a detailed slide, but if you're interested, you can go back and review some of these um, signs, um, the characteristics that make certain masses um, benign and other masses uh, more malignant on ultrasound. These are all ultrasound findings here. And in terms of the hands-on practice with ultrasound, I mean, be great if we had the simulator. We don't have this simulator. I'm working on trying to acquire it. Uh, perhaps going forward, we can get our hands on this. Um, it's not very expensive. And um, it's got all kinds of goodies in here, like lymph nodes, cysts, um, ductal ectasia, um, tumors, and uh, other things. And so, um, yeah, it's pretty good to, to have all this in a, in a simulator before you move on to the, to the real McCoy, so to speak. But what I'm going to show you next are two video clips. Um, 
One is on how to perform a breast ultrasound, and, um, and then another one is on uh, a surgeon, a breast surgeon doing an ultrasound-guided procedure of the breast. Scan the inner aspect of the breast, or medial quadrants, in the supine position with the ipsilateral arm raised above the head to maximize the image quality. Roll the patient into the supine oblique position to scan the outer aspect of the breast or the lateral quadrants. Scanning the breast in the radial and anti-radial planes is exclusive to breast ultrasound. The radial imaging plane is arranged in a wagon wheel pattern with the nipple at the center. The radial plane is parallel to the ductal system and is extremely useful for detecting ductal lesions. The anti-radial imaging plane is oriented 90 degrees to the radial plane and perpendicular to the ductal system. To scan the breast with the clock method, place the transducer in the radial plane at the 12 o'clock position. Ensure that the notch of the transducer is facing the nipple. Manipulate the transducer until a suitable image of the breast is obtained. Freeze the image and then annotate the breast side, clock position, scan plane, zone, and structures. Save the image. Unfreeze the image and then scan the breast by rotating through every clock position in a clockwise direction towards 6 o'clock. Freeze, annotate, and save the images at 1, 3, and four o'clock. After obtaining an image at the six o'clock position, reorientate the transducer so that the notch faces away from the nipple. Continue to scan in a clockwise direction, saving annotated images at the seven, nine, and ten o'clock positions. If the entire breast has not been viewed completely during the first radial scan, a second radial scan may be required to image the outer zones of the breast. After completing the radial scan, return the transducer to the 12 o'clock position at the outer margin of the breast. Rotate the transducer to the anti-radial plane. Slide the transducer from the outer margin of the breast towards the nipple. Repeat this at each of the clock positions, moving in a clockwise direction. At the clock face positions 12, 3, 6, and 9, freeze, annotate, and save a suitable image from the mid portion of the breast. If a lesion is encountered, manipulate the transducer and optimize the image. Freeze and annotate according to the protocol. Measure the length of the lesion by placing two calipers on the superior and inferior margins of the mass. Measure the height of the lesion by placing two calipers on the anterior and posterior margins of the mass. Save the image and unfreeze to continue. Rotate the transducer to the transverse plane of the lesion. Freeze and annotate the image. Measure the width of the lesion by placing two calipers on the medial and lateral margins. Save the image and unfreeze to continue. Select the color button to obtain color Doppler images. Freeze, annotate, and save a suitable color image. Select Power Doppler and use a vocal frematis technique to confirm the margins of the lesion. Ask the patient to hum. Vibrations from the hum will pass through the chest wall and breast tissue. A lesion will not usually transmit a signal from the hum, causing the margins of the lesion to appear more distinct on the ultrasound image. To scan the nipple and areola, place a generous amount of acoustic gel directly onto the nipple. Place the transducer to the right of the areola in the longitudinal plane. Scan the area from the right of the areola over the nipple and just beyond the left of the areola. If any pathology is encountered, measure the length, height, and width of the lesion. If no pathology is encountered, return the transducer to the midline of the nipple in the longitudinal plane. 
Manipulate the transducer until a representative image of the nipple is obtained. Freeze, annotate, and save the image. Repeat the process for the transverse plane by sliding the transducer from the superior aspect of the areola over the nipple and just beyond the inferior aspect of the areola. Return to the middle of the nipple areola complex and obtain a representative image in the transverse plane. Apply gel to the right axilla. To scan the axilla, place the transducer in the longitudinal plane of the superomedial aspect of the axilla with the notch pointing superiorly. Using a grid technique, slide the transducer horizontally towards the superolateral aspect, then slide it inferiorly to the inferolateral and finally to the inferomedial aspects of the axilla. Repeat the process in the transverse plane. Place the transducer in the superomedial aspect of the axilla in a transverse position. Slide inferiorly, then laterally, and finally superiorly until the whole axilla has been examined. Return the transducer to the midline in the longitudinal plane. Optimize the image, then freeze, annotate, and save the image. Repeat the process in the transverse plane. Give the patient a towel or cloth to wipe off the gel. Now basically what we're doing initially is just putting numbing medication in. And so we'll numb up the skin of the breast and then the underlying breast tissue. Do you feel this? A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, this is on the other side of it. It's on and off. Okay. If you look up on the screen, you can see the fibroadenoma to the right, and then the, the numbing medication is going all the way over to the back side. There. And then I'm going to put some up over the top, which does two things. One is it gives us some numbing up top, but the other is see how close this, is, this fibroadenoma is to her skin. Once we start the freezing, we need to protect that skin, otherwise she's going to get frostbite, and then it sort of defeats the purpose of a nice cosmetic procedure. So in putting some numbing up here, it gives her the anesthetic effect, but it also drops that fibroadenoma down and gives us a little room for that ice to do its job. And then the last thing I'm going to do is put some numbing actually underneath it, because it's not only close to the skin, but this line down here is her pectoralis muscle underneath. Mm -hmm. So sometimes as that ice freezes, it kind of gets real cold on the pec. So I'll put some numbing down. I'm going to get it below. So you're going to, you probably will feel this a little bit more. This is um, actually a step we don't always do. In fact, if I've done the core biopsy, this is already done. Um, it's pretty standard when you do biopsies on things mm -hmm. to leave a marker in place, and especially with this procedure, because eventually the goal is going to be that the fibroadenoma goes away. We want um, basically a record on our subsequent mammograms and images where it was. Okay, go ahead and get started. So you're going to hear a lot of noises over here, you're going to hear the machine turn on, and then you're going to hear this kind of chug chugging noise, go ahead. So what you'll see if you're watching on the screen, you see the probe there and you see it starting to get black behind it. That's because the ultrasound waves can't go through the ice. You'll see that double white line get higher and higher and higher. And that's just as it's starting to engulf the whole thing. It sort of eclipses it. As you can see, you have to have the probe centered directly in the middle of the lesion. Um, this is not something you can just do by palpation or, or just by feel.